This episode of Analog Toys would not have been possible without the kind generosity of Palatoy toy designer Bob Breakin, a true gentleman whose inside knowledge of the development of Action Force is nothing short of overwhelming. Thanks again, Bob. Many of the images in this video can also be found on the excellent website Blood for the Baron, and I'll leave a link to the site in the description below. Palatoy's Action Force toy line was a retail triumph when first launched in 1982, and today its popularity with collectors continues to grow at an exponential rate. With the first year of Action Force being such a huge success, Palatoy expanded the range in 1983 and introduced a new backstory for the Action Force concept. This backstory also introduced four new and very different Action Force units. Z-Force, Q-Force, Space Force and the SAS. This new fantasy themed concept elevated Palatoy's Action Force toy line to a whole new level of popularity among the children of the early 80s. But at the time, this generation of fans never knew how close they came to enjoying toys based on a fifth Action Force unit. So today Analog Toys is going to take a deep dive into the mystery of the Action Force Special Weapons Team. And to do this video justice, we've called in the assistance of Action Force superfan Chris Bestair in the Toy Business McLeod, aka Diagnostic 80 from the Full Force Podcast. Hi there, I'm Chris McLeod aka Diagnostic 80 from the Full Force and Talking Joe Podcasts. And when it comes to Palatoy's Action Force, I am a huge fan. As a young child, I remember being given a big box of loose Action Force figures and vehicles by our next door neighbour and World War II tank gunner hero, Joe Eakins. They ranged from the initial series that highlighted the 12 best-selling Action Man figures in the three and three quarter size, to the latest sub-team series featuring Z-Force, Q-Force, SAS Force, Space Force, and the Red Shadows. I was amazed at some of the designs and instantly fell in love with the line, despite them only having five points of articulation. There was just something about them. Thanks to their insignias and colour schemes, I was able to organise them into their allotted teams before I was even aware of what it all meant, and that was something that appealed to my organisational nature. In later life, I've collected loose, carded and boxed examples of these amazing toys, and can honestly say it's one of the most interesting and creative lines ever developed. Even more interesting when you consider what we could have had with Special Weapons Force, and that's where this video comes in. The Special Weapons Force had the potential to become just as legendary as the other four Action Force units, so join us as we take you through a detailed history of this unreleased toy line. Hello Palatoy fans, my name is Tony and welcome to an Analog Toys special feature, Action Force and the mystery of the Special Weapons Team. Beginning in 1966, British toy company Palatoy achieved phenomenal success with its flagship toy line, the 12-inch Action Man, a product that was incredibly popular during the late 1960s, being voted the toy of the year on its launch, and the demand for this fantastic boy's toy continued to grow throughout most of the 1970s. For the first 10 years of his existence, Action Man seemed to be an almost unstoppable force on toy store shelves, achieving a special 10-year award in 1975. Action Man's popularity reigned supreme, that was until the arrival of Star Wars action figures, whose insane popularity was boosted by the smash hit film released in 1977. Even as Action Man began to gradually lose his appeal to other fantasy themed concepts such as Star Wars, he did manage to hang on long enough to be awarded the Toy of the Decade in 1980, before finally ending production in 1984. Developed by American toy company Kenner, the Star Wars toy line revolutionised the way that young children played with small action figures by shrinking the scale down from the previously popular height of 12 inches to a much smaller 3 3 quarter inch size. This smaller scale enabled Kenner to produce a wide variety of spaceships and vehicles, something that was more cost prohibitive in a larger 12 inch scale. Kenner was also a sister company to Palatoy in the General Mills toy group and therefore Palatoy was well placed to market Star Wars toys in the UK. With the smaller scale Star Wars figures selling for far less at retail than Palatoy's previous market leader Action Man, they quickly saw a decline in sales of their most famous product, while also reaping the bonanza that was Star Wars. Wanting to keep the Action Man brand alive in toy shops, Palatoy decided to copy the Star Wars scale and release Action Man in a new 3 3 quarter inch format in 1982. Development of this new toy line began in the early spring of 1981. The best-selling vehicles such as Land Rover and Scorpion Tank were not scaled down, but a new range of more modern-looking vehicles were designed not based on anything seen before. Packaging was flagged with the new Action Force logo, but also the Action Man logo to help maintain continuity. As soon as this new concept was launched in 1982, the management and marketing teams at Palatoy changed completely. 
Managing Director Bob Simpson and Marketing Director Les Cook had left to form their own company and others soon followed. They had seen the direction that the General Mills toy group based in New York was going with its pursuit of global branding. Throughout the 70s, Palatoy had been given free reign to develop new toy lines through design and by licensing from other toy group competitors, such as Mego and Tomy. Although by the early 80s, that freedom was coming to an end. New managing director Peter Waterman put together a completely new marketing team to sell in the UK the toys designed and developed through Toy Group in the US. But thankfully, this team also had fresh ideas for the Action Force concept. Thanks to Star Wars and a number of other related sci-fi media, space and fantasy was all the rage. Action figure toys based on historical sources was passé and the decision was taken to reconceive the successful Action Force concept for 1983 with a new look and a new focus. There was one big problem though. The design department was given very limited resources to make this happen, so tooling for new characters and vehicles was not in the budget. Using flair and ingenuity, the designers created new characters by mixing and matching body components in new colours. So for instance, a commando body may have ground assault arms and legs and a US paratrooper head. The modern looking vehicles that were originally produced for Action Force were ideal for adaption by the same mix and match process and with some additional simple new mouldings. After much brainstorming and conceptual work, most of which never saw the light of day, the design and marketing departments decided to introduce an enemy team for Action Force to do battle with. This team would be known as the Red Shadows, who were commanded by the ruthless Baron Ironblood, intent on world domination. The Red Shadows highlighted exactly why this toy line was so inventive. From weird helmets like the standard trooper's chinless Death Star Imperial Gunner-inspired noggin, to Baron Ironblood's coal bucket, this sub-team was weird and wonderful. Not only that, but they also played fast and loose with technology, cloning Krakens from a creature found in the frozen wastes of the North Pole, and developing a cyborg skeleton called Skeletron. It really is an incredible group of bad guys. Oh yeah, and the Robo Skull. As if I wasn't going to mention that. According to the storyline conceived by Palatoy and further developed in the Battle Action Force comics, the United Nations responded to the threat of the Red Shadows by forming the Action Force, which was made up of four different teams. Firstly, we had the Z-Force, the conventional Action Force Army, the Q-Force for nautical operations, the Space Force for outer space battle, and finally the SAS, a covert operations unit who were the only team to be copied directly from the Palatoy Action Man line. The wicked Baron Ironblood wants to rule the world through terror. Create your own Action Force to stop him. The Baron commands the hideous hyena to attack with Kraken in command. But they don't know about the new SAS Wolverine. The Wolverine fires its first missiles. Kraken tries to strike back. But the power of the Wolverine is decisive. Operation Hyena is over. But where will the Baron strike next? Action Force Toys. The battle has just begun. According to Palatoy toy designer Bob Breakin, when Palatoy were developing the new 1983 range, several different teams were designed and presented at the new products meeting. One such team was the Action Force Air Force, prototypes of which can be seen here in this early photograph. It seems no one from Palatoy can say for sure exactly how many different Action Force teams were developed, but several different teams were produced in different colorways using the mix and match process before the company decided to proceed with the development of the four Action Force units that would eventually arrive at retail. Evidence of most of these other teams in physical or photographic form does not exist, lost when the Palatoy design department was closed down in 1984. However, some examples were sent to the Museum of Childhood in Bethnal Green, along with many other toys and prototypes at the time. Years later, the collecting community would begin to learn of a fifth Action Force team, entitled the Special Weapons Force, and the evidence suggests that this team came very close to being fully manufactured by Palatoy. Following a hot tip in 2008, Action Force collector Dave Tree visited the V&A Museum of Childhood in Bethnal Green, where, in the archive room, he uncovered a prototype action figure which was in a bag labelled Special Weapons Force. The label also indicated that this figure was a scientist and his code name was Boffin, and this figure had a completely different colour scheme to all the other Action Force figures. The Boffin prototype also sported a logo on his chest that no one had seen before. Much speculation followed this discovery, including the rumour that this figure was possibly based on Bob Breakin himself. Boffin, yeah. Uh, was that like an attempt, Bob, to get you <laughs> as an action figure? Because I just, there seems to be a very strong visual connection there with yourself. Was that at, at all in the, in, the, in the idea? Well, it's a funny story this, but just after I left college, yeah. I had a girlfriend who used to call me Boof. 
And if you noticed on the um, Robo Skull blueprint thing, yes, yes, on it it says it says the person who drew that was Buff Breakin. Oh, I've, I've never noticed, noticed that. that. I haven't. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to check that out. <laughs> I put that I put that on there, buff breaking. Amazing. So I think the buffing came maybe came from that. Following this epic discovery, Dave Tree organised a second visit to the museum, and it was well worth the trip. Upon his return, Dave unearthed three more unproduced figures that all used the same body type as the Action Force ground assault figure from 1982. This original figure was also a redesign of the 12-inch Action Man ground assault set from 1980. Just like the Boffin action figure, each of these three prototype figures were contained in clear plastic bags, and they all had labels attached, which detailed the code name for each character. Fixer, Sniper, and Lightning. Finally, a fifth Special Weapons Force member was found in the archives, and was easily identifiable as a repainted Flash action figure from Hasbro's G.I. Joe line, and this figure was labelled Bombardier. All of these examples prove that a fifth Action Force team had been heavily developed by Palatoy, but never made it into the final Action Force lineup in 1983. At that time, marketing thought that four teams were enough for the relaunch of the new fantasy-based Action Force. But what Palatoy didn't realise at the time was that Hasbro had spent years developing its own 3 3 quarter inch G.I. Joe range following the success of Kenner's Star Wars toy line. Obviously this information had been kept under strict secrecy at Hasbro, until its launch at the New York Toy Fair just about a month after the Palatoy launch of Action Force at the UK Toy Fair in January of 1982. Having much more time for development, the Hasbro designers came up with a far more articulated figure than Star Wars. Palatoy had not made that leap though. The decision was made soon after the UK Toy Fair in 1981, and Palatoy were forced to copy the similar Star Wars 5-point articulation design in order to get the figures out the following year. After taking the Hasbro licensed G.I. Joe figure and releasing it as Action Man in 1966, Palatoy used to have a good relationship with Hasbro, but this connection was lost when Hasbro discontinued the 12 inch G.I. Joe in 1977. In 1982, after the launches that year at both the UK and US toy fairs, the relationship between Palatoy and Hasbro was re established. An arrangement was made for Palatoy to include Hasbro designed G.I. Joe vehicles in the reconceived Action Force range. Palatoy subsequently moulded these vehicles in Action Force colourways, with borrowed tooling from Hasbro, and G.I. Joe action figures were also taken and recoloured, to be sold with the vehicles as drivers, because G.I. Joe figures could sit more easily at the wheel. This explains why a repainted G.I. Joe Flash action figure was found among the other prototypes at the V&A Museum of Childhood, and what is of particular interest is that the Bombardier had actually been seen many years before the 2008 museum discovery. US toy collector Ron Connor purchased the first Bombardier prototype from the Whiz Bang Toy Shop in Orlando, Florida in 1999, and over the next decade its existence would confound the Action Force and G.I. Joe collecting communities, leading to heated debates regarding numerous theories as to the origins of the figure. That was until 2009, when Action Force toy designer Bob Breakin revealed two old photos that were independent proof of just how far the Special Weapons Force had actually been developed. The images show the Hasbro designed mobile missile system that has a completely different colour scheme to either the G.I. Joe MMS or the Action Force SAS version. However, the greatest discoveries held by the photographs were the repainted interpretations of the Vamp Jeep and the Flat Cannon. Also noteworthy is the fact that the Action Force figures in these photos have different paint applications when compared to the prototypes found in the museum. In particular, the Bombardier, who is painted in a sky blue colour pattern, and after learning this information, Ron Connor re-examined his Bombardier prototype, and the evidence was undeniable. Ron's Bombardier had in fact been repainted at one time, and had previously been painted in the same shade of blue as seen in Bob's photos. Most of this information can be found on the Blood for the Baron website. However, whilst researching this video, I found another piece of evidence that suggests that Palatoy may have had a second attempt at releasing the Special Weapons Team in 1984. Before explaining my theory, I need to call out the fact that Bob's photos look very similar to other Action Force photos used in the 1983 Palatoy trade catalogue, which would likely date the images as being taken in late 1982. However, in this promotional photograph, you can clearly see the Special Weapons Force prototypes, with some of the figures again painted in different colours. I date this photograph as being taken in either late 1983 or early 1984, and this is due to a similar image from the same photographer showing the Robo Skull a vehicle that was not released by Palatoy until 1984. Ultimately though, it doesn't really matter how many times Palatoy tried to release the Special Weapons Team, because we as children never got the opportunity to play with them, and I think that's a real shame. 
The Special Weapons Force prototypes look like a toy line that I would have loved when I was a child. The figures are futuristic, the repainted vamp jeep looked amazing, and who wouldn't have wanted an action figure incarnation of Bob Breakin, beard and all, even if I had no idea who he was all those years ago. The moment I found out about Special Weapons Force, I spent hours studying the photos and would daydream about how awesome this group of repaints would actually have been. Boffin was the most interesting to me because there hadn't really been a character like him in the line before. The general focus was on the soldiers on the front line and it was very rare that you'd get a character from behind the scenes like that. Another aspect that attracted me to Special Weapons Force was the fact that they had been found in two clearly different decos, which means a decent amount of development went into this never-to-be-released sub-team. I often wonder whether I would have been a fan of this sub-team had it made it to production, and can't help but think a lot of the allure is down to the fact it never came out, and examples of them are in fact impossible to find in the wild. I'm sure it has a bearing, but I have to say I find the deco so cool and being a sucker for repaints means I probably would have adored these no matter what age I was. If you do happen to come across an actual pre-production figure or vehicle from Special Weapons Force then my birthday is in November and you can send it to me as a gift at... Many collectors have speculated as to why the Special Weapons Force was never released at retail, but Bob Breakin explains it best. It wasn't due to funding because having a 5th Action Force team would not have incurred any extra money for tooling. It was a marketing decision based on the fact that an enemy team and 4 Action Force teams were what the market could take. They were thinking about advertising, um, production considerations, physical shelf space in the stores, etc. etc. If Palito had not re-established the link with Hasbro, and not made that arrangement to include G.I. Joe vehicles, who knows? That changed the whole direction of Action Force. Eventually Action Force was reconceived. Baron Ironblood morphed into Cobra Commander and the separate teams became one Action Force team and all Palitoy figures and vehicles gave way to Hasbro designs. If all that had never happened, if the design department had continued, if General Mills hadn't decided to get out of the toy business and global branding had not changed everything, Special Weapons would have possibly come out in 1985. And after that, we could have been designing a new Action Force team each year. We had others in the pipeline. But we can only dream. Apart from the Bombardier owned by Ron Connor, no collector owns any of the other Special Weapons Force prototypes, and that's just how it should be. They are in the possession of the v &A Museum of Childhood, where I hope they will be preserved for generations to come. So there you have it, the mystery of the Action Force Special Weapons team has now been declassified. I would like to thank my co-presenter Chris McLeod for his contribution to this video, and if you haven't done so already, head over to the Full Force podcast on YouTube, click subscribe and enjoy their amazing content. I promise you won't regret it. I'm Tony from Analog Toys, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.